If I know you're not coming for Zendaya right now. That's all I'm saying. I know you're not coming for Zendaya. Like Zendaya. <laughs> who's the producers and who's the owners of all these different facilities? They're white people. They say, because I can't grasp this, because it's out of my realm of knowledge, I'm going to villainize it. Out of all the Black films I've seen, I related to this the most. That's the moment I knew he had mastered anxiety. Black Tuesday Month is something that needs to be targeted toward young kids. Woman King? Yes. The hell? No, no, no. And I really hope we're still friends, everyone, after this, but... Hey, everyone. Welcome to the second in Quibi Roundtable. This month is February, and we're focusing on Black History Month and movies and TV shows that relate to it. And I'm going to let the movie critics on in Quibi introduce themselves. I'm Andrew. Donna. I'm MG. I'm Andrew. Went too early. <laughs> I'm Samoy. I'm Jane. I'm Bonnie. And I'm Warren. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for another Kluvi Roundtable. Um, today, we're discussing the ways that Black filmmakers and stories are changing the narratives around Black experiences. We say Black experiences because Blackness is a rainbow, right? There are a lot of complementary lenses, and we're going to be kind of exploring those things. We've, of course, got a wonderful panel, so let's kind of dive right into it. I wanted to start with talking about um, what I call Black anxieties or social political ideas in general um, that are kind of explored through horror films. I think about people like Jordan Peele, George Romero with like Night of the Living Dead, those kind of films that place Black characters into this experience and then kind of explore from that kind of natural angle how things go. And I'm going to pick a trail to start here. Um, I want you to talk about how you feel Jordan Peele has kind of jumped into the fray with his films like Nope and Get Out and has kind of explored Black anxieties from like a more natural standpoint. I know you said Nope and Get Out, but I want to start with Us because when you say anxiety, <laughs> I feel like that's the first movie that pops into my head because the way the characters, the moment they meet their counterparts, that is one of my favorite moments of anxiety across all of cinema because there's families inside. The man is very wary about what's happening. The knocking is happening. and. Then he walks out and sees himself. That's the moment I knew he had mastered anxiety because interestingly enough, that was the one I watched before I watched Get Out. So that was my introduction to Jordan Peele's work with anxiety. Then I watched Get Out and now, and I get exactly why you would mention him when it comes to black anxiety, because the build up there, the moment, the first moment when he sees that photo album where, where all the other boyfriends were there, peak anxiety <laughs> moment again just like the one from us I, and i love the fact that he could have made it you know like a lecture but instead he he manages to make an interesting narrative that's genuinely terrifying mm -hmm. but still doesn't shy away from like talking about the truths because the best friend Lydia how are you his character like i love the way the monologue around white supremacy happens through him the fact that the perspective is of not the protagonist because he is in the situation where he's being manipulated but from that other person i want to comment on that because i feel like there's also this trope that there's always the best friend who's like thinking that everything's wrong but hasn't done anything and like it's and and so i love that we have this side story and get out of Lil Rel Howery trying to convince the police. He figured out something's happening and no one else has figured yeah. out anything's going on and no one's listening to him. And it's that whole trope of like, if you would just listen to this person, this has been so anxiety producing, but it's also comedy. Like Jordan Peele has mastered how to do horror and comedy because horror and comedy have very similar, like the suspense makes it that much more impactful element like if you're waiting till you get to that punchline the longer that suspense builds up the more you're like mm. waiting for that punchline and the same thing with horror i i love that side story and get out because it also takes you out of the horror for a bit it gives you like a relief which is nice for people who like aren't as into horror <laughs> i'm like okay so <laughs> yeah, some comedy some true. lightness so originally i was thinking jordan peele adds humor to the horror as a way to make it more re relatable for the black spectator but then after watching Get Out so many times, I realized that the humor was meant to distract what was really happening in the plot. So I'm thinking about the scene with Chris. He meets the white guests that are part of the party. And there's something funny. It's like uncanny. It's like it's something funny about the way how they're interacting with him. The Tiger Woods comment and asking mm. him was it better to like sleep with a black man. But really, it was all just like a ploy to 
get to see is Chris physical enough to take control of. So I really like, and speaking of the best friend, he said something about using men as like black slaves. And I actually believed it because it kind of made sense what was happening with Logan being with the older white woman. So this also happened in us where the daughter, I think her name's Zora. She was saying there's like this conspiracy about the water is controlling people. And once again, you're sort of kind of believing it. He's kind of putting like these ideas into you, making you think that, oh, this is what's happening. But really there's a plot twist. So I kind of really like how these conspiracies are really connected to the actual truth of what's happening. I think like the main discovery in Get Out is actually white anxieties. Anxieties that white people have about black people. And I think it's a very interesting and very novelty psychological moment there. I'm coming from a different cultural background. So when I was watching Get Out, I was actually focused on why are they doing this? Like, this is weird. And then I understand because then it kind of like subconsciously, it sends me to the later work of Leni Riefenstahl when she was going and like photographing Nubian people for the beauty of their bodies. And it was like, ah, ah, okay. Then there is something new to it and something very interesting in the area of like subconsciousness that for me was the most valuable part about this movie. No, that makes sense, Warren. Just kind of jumping off of that, what do you think it is about the sunken place that has such a grip on popular imagination? Like, what do you think it is about that imagery of him sinking into the floor and like into space and like uh, kind of losing his body? It's just one of those things where like every single time I think about the big abyss or you think about anything similar to that where you're, you're either in the middle of the ocean or you're like floating out into space there's just one of those things one of those feelings that you just can't escape as a human being no matter who you are so like having that imagery and in, in the movie kind of like allows to get multiple people's perspectives like hey this is what this feels like whenever this is gonna, happening to you it's just like a scare factor you know that's again an example of how jordan peele masters the depiction of anxiety because this time it wasn't through words it was a literal visual depiction and I have not seen anyone express what an anxiety attack could feel like better than that moment. When he's sinking through, I could feel that anxiety attacks that I have had myself feel exactly like what you would imagine him to be feeling when he's falling through that. This is what I love about him. He's a visual storyteller instead of just a verbal one. And interestingly, the history lessons or the commentary on society more than what is going on through dialogue. It's through these little tidbits you can see that are left here and there in the depiction of things happening. Piggybacking off of what Troy just said, Troy's talking about how he doesn't have to just use the verbal, even though his scripts and the dialogue is just like amazing. It's the visuals, but it's also the auditory. There's this tapping of the cup that's going on and this swirling. And it's like, there's all these auditory sounds that are like leading up to this moment where the sound completely cuts out. And I think it's the first time in the movie that it's done that. It's a very jarring feeling when all sound cuts out. Something has happened, something is wrong, and I don't know if I'm going to escape this. Like in that moment, you literally are like, will I gain my hearing back? Like what is going to happen? Puts the audience in a space where like you are right there with Chris in that moment as he is falling. I also think that's kind of the first time in the movie that anything really like supernatural happened on screen. I feel like everything else leading up to that was just like, oh, it's the typical lead up to a horror movie. And that's the moment where it changes. That's the moment where we go into this like space that's like, oh, we've literally left the movie. We literally see the image of the room in front of us. Like we have just taken a dive out of the movie into some other space that we don't have any definition for. And that is terrifying. And I wanna talk about Katherine Keener in that scene because she is such an incredible villain and with very little energy. Like she's just sitting there doing her therapy thing. And all of a sudden she goes from being this like, almost like the most likable of the family that he's met so far to she's actually the real antagonist of this story. And she doesn't even have to do very much to do it. And that is just like. Speaking of black anxiety, right? Like that imagery where he, she, he's falling and she's on the chair. Like, again, the visual of it is right there of exactly what black anxiety you could be talking about. It's definitely a symbolic representation of oppression of black people in America, but I watched it so many times and I looked at it again and learning more about body genres. We talked about horror tropes, 
And a lot of people consider Chris to be a final girl, not just because he survives at the end of the horror movie. That's usually what happens with girls and slasher. It's because for the most part throughout the whole film, he is a passive male, right? We usually see passive female like in horror, only toward the end they're really active. That's when they go against their villain. So in this scene, it is an orgasm scene. Yes. <laughs> and it's an orgasm scene because we are seeing Chris crying we're seeing his mouth open we're hearing him breathing it's like he's going through some sort of ecstasy and this is what women go through in slasher films and i find it really interesting because we do not see men go through that they, they go through pain i call it man pain some sort of transformation turning into a werewolf feeling the pain of like changing but women usually go through this emotional pain happening to them mentally and that's exactly what was happening to chris and going back to the bodily autonomy this is what women go through in horror films they don't have control over the bodies but in this case, a white person is trying to take over his body. And this is something that we usually see with women. So I really like how Jordan Peele switched the gender roles. Samoy, what a wonderful discussion there. I love your interpretation of this scene. I completely agree with you with this idea of Chris as this final girl sort of uh representation in the film and we are used to seeing when we have women's bodies in horror films particularly when we're talking about their subgenre we have them opened up we have them invaded so maybe a spirit possessing them and invading their body but more often than not we're talking about a weapon opening them up and a weapon invading and thrusting into their body so this idea of this symbolic sort of possession and somebody coming into that space a really interesting sort of interpretation of this sort of like a new form of body horror that really brings psychological horror and body horror that slasher genre together in such an interesting and sort of intellectual way. I think we're all really praising the work that Peel did here and I completely agree. I know this sort of bringing comedy and horror together that has, it's happened since the beginning of horror. Even um, Alfred Hitchcock told us that we need to make the audience laugh. We need to release that tension. He was, you know, the master of tension, the master of dread, and he knew that we need to let the audience release that. And I know there was a little resistance when Jordan Peele started making horror because people were like, he's a comedian. How can he do that? But it's because he understands that timing. He understands the importance. And that's what makes the end of the film so very powerful to me. Thank you, Andrew, for bringing up Night of the Living Dead, because I can't help but think about the end of Night of the Living Dead, if you're familiar. We have our, our male protagonist who has survived this entire zombie apocalypse. The, the morning has come. The, the rescue team is there. They're going to save him. And they shoot him dead. People ask George A. Romero, like, did you make a, a decision here? Was this um, based on race that you cast this person? Are you making a political commentary? And he said, no, he was the best actor I knew. Like, he, it had nothing to do with that yet all interpret it in that way and I think we have this parallel with the final scene of Get Out he's crawling away from this family like everybody's dead he's just carnage everywhere and then this car shows up with sirens and I know when I was in the audience everybody went oh because right away we all have the exact same interpretation like he's getting killed he's gonna go down for this and then his friend comes out the relief like that that anxiety that we had building that dreadfully we get it released and uh, Samoy was comparing this to orgasms before and I think that's an orgasmic moment as well suddenly we have that release and we're all so thankful and we laugh we can't help it that response is just brought out in us I think that Jordan Peele really knows what the audience is going to do with those moments he's trying to create a reaction in audience members which i feel like so many filmmakers forget about now so i had the same feeling about night of the living death because i was like isn't it crazy that he fought a zombie apocalypse got people inside to actually listen to him like you know they're all like why should we have to listen to him makes it through the night and then i'm just like oh my god you shoot him the first thing in the morning and the best thing about it was i was in a film class talking about this the best thing about it was the idea that Police brutality stories have been happening forever. It's not some new 2000 story that people think it is. It's been happening forever. And so I, I really appreciate that scene in that movie. What AJ was saying about like the fact that we have this ending and it subverts what you think is gonna happen, right? Like you literally see Allison Williams character like smile because she's like, oh, the cops are gonna save me. Like, obviously I'm the white girl, I'm gonna make it through. Like she sees herself as a final girl in this movie. Like, let's be honest, right? But then like they, they flip the narrative and it's his friend and it's like, also, what we were just talking about with Lil Rel Howery, like getting to save the day after all of this like work that he's done to save the day, he gets to do it. Do people know that the original ending of this movie was what you would expect it to be? Because originally, 
he got he got caught and he got he got like taken to prison and that was like what happened so people didn't like that ending because obviously they wanted it to be a better ending and so he wound up changing it but initially there actually is an alternate ending to this film that is exactly the ending you would expect it to be which i find very interesting what jordan peele does in it he's still like exposing racism but in a very very subtle way this fetishizing it's a certain type of stereotype kind of like reducing black people to just their bodies you know we want to take over their bodies we want to live in them because we consider them as perfect and it's like it's in the background this idea is in the background but it is there this movie came out in what 2017 right so this was in the middle of donald trump's presidency this was pre-pandemic pre all the George Floyd Black Lives Matter stuff going on. It didn't mean there wasn't already racism stuff going on. It doesn't mean that like there was anything that was hidden about it, but but it wasn't at the forefront in the way that it became as as the years went on as we realized just how many like the fact that the KKK came back is like so baffling and upsetting to me. Like we should have been done with Nazis years ago and the fact that they're still a thing is like I think that Jordan Peele was kind of at the forefront of acknowledging racism is still very much alive. It is just in a different package now and we need to be aware of that. And we weren't at the time, and we still weren't after this movie. We were just like, wow, look at the social commentary. But it was like, no, 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 no. Please watch this movie. Understand what I'm saying about where we are as a country, as a society, and do better. I love Jordan Peele, and I love what he's doing with his work, and I love that we're talking about it. But we need to move from just like having conversations about how great the movie is to like, what should this movie be teaching us about ourselves and how we should be behaving in society? Not that that's yeah. this conversation, but just like that yeah. is another thing that this movie, especially in the years since it came out and everything that's been going on, I'm like, this was several years before all of this stuff really started getting kicked up and he was already commenting on it and already like, watch out, this is real, let's pay attention. I mean, this is what I was saying when I said it's not a lecture, it's, it's really a mirror. He, he just told us exactly what he experiences without making a lecture about it. If the Black Lives Matter hadn't happened, then we wouldn't have not been aware of what's happening in our Black community. We need to be more aware. And now because of Black Lives Matter, like they're doing all these protests, like these small organizations. Like these have been inspired by Black stories because Black stories spread us this message about anti-discrimination and anti-racism. It's real life concepts that we never learned in school, but now kids today like they're learning this in school this anti-discrimination anti-racism and our black stories are sometimes used to promote and emphasize messages about anti-racism and anti-discrimination like this is applied to the real world i mean this coronavirus pandemic like all of the ethnic groups like they're divided because of racial differences it's like we need to bring everybody back together when people usually talk about racism is among like young adult audiences, like the older audience, the older target market, but Black History Month is something that needs to be targeted toward young kids. Like the children and families, like they're the younger target market. And even young kids like need to be aware of Black History Month because it teaches mm. them about anti-racism, anti-discrimination. There's this animation movie called The Sea Beast that's targeted toward young children. And there's this girl named Maisie Brumble and she is of African-American descent and she is playing the major role. She's playing the lead role. That's something that you don't see in mo animated movies like all the time. And it's also been nominated for an Oscar. I think that gives us a nice little transition actually. Because I want to talk about oppositional gazes. Because, you know, the traditional cinematic and social lens, right? It's a cishet male, right? Nominally the white male, right? And so I want to talk about, like, women's spectatorship, maybe it's specifically Black women's spectatorship, and just other lenses, movies that kind of present other lenses. So somewhere I'll let you kind of kick us off. Okay, yeah. So you mentioned the oppositional gaze. So that was coined by Bell Hooks, who is a um, Black woman feminist. And when I think of oppositional gays, I definitely think of Eve Bayou, directed by Casey Lemon. The film is basically centered on Eve, of a little girl played by Journey Smollett, and it's really focused on her perspective. A lot of it has to do with reflecting and memory. When I think about this oppositional gaze, I'm thinking about the power of looking. That's actually how Bell Hooks described it. The camera is a gaze. So really, that film, I could tell, was Casey Lemon's perspective. Out of all the Black films I've seen, I related to this the most. I related a lot to Eve. 
and we don't really look alike. You know, she's a little bit lighter to me. She has red hair. There were a lot of things that uh, spoke to me. A lot of it had to do with post memory. And post memory is basically stories that your family have told you. They're like, they're their memories that become your memories. So that's kind of what was happening in the film. And a lot of it had to do with this character figuring out her ancestral roots, her African roots. And I think at that point, I was trying to figure that out too. For a while, ever since I was a little girl, I was trying to figure out what was so special about being Black. Now, I feel like most of the people in my life already knew who they were. They, they had, you know, some of them were from, I don't know, let's say they're like Jamaican and they're, they're proud about their heritage, about being Jamaican. And I wasn't really proud to be Trinidadian. So I'm trying to figure out what's so special about being a part of West Indian culture and then Ease by You, which does have that West Indian culture because West Indian culture is originated from West Africa. So a lot of our myths and stories, our culture comes from West Africa. That's kind of what it means to be Black is that even though we came from these different countries, it all kind of relates back to Africa, these certain points in Africa. One of the main things she was discovering was hoodoo, which is different from voodoo. Hoodoo is more like the slaves were resisting. They had this practice and they used it against their slaveholders. Yeah, and I, I thought, wow, this is really cool. This isn't evil, right? In the media that's directed by white people, they have a way of making it evil and making black people evil. But this is kind of cool that they use it not just as a resistance, but to help people. So like a lot of healing and spirituality between it. I heard these stories from my mom and from her mom, which I was really proud to be a part of that and to understand it and to be with this character trying to figure out who I am. I adore bell hooks and Samoy was telling I think something that's really important and it's just sort of about this construction of narratives and villainizing black history and practices like hoodoo and voodoo because we do have these perspectives of the filmmakers. If we do have, you know, a white filmmaker who doesn't understand this history, who has no stake in that heritage, they will create this this narrative and these stories without that knowledge. And bell hooks talks about um this idea of the other and you know when we perform othering usually we have one or two reactions to the other which sometimes happen simultaneously so we react with fear or fascination and I think that this is such an important thing that we see happening I'm very interested in voodoo and hoodoo and that history I've been to the the museum I read that research and the way it's represented in film is usually in a very negative light and I think this comes from this othering process of not just like black history and black identities but also things that people don't understand they say, because I can't grasp this, because it's out of my realm of knowledge, I'm going to villainize it. I'm going to demonize it. I'm going to turn it into something scary. And this perpetuated throughout the horror genre, a genre I love, but we can be critical of things that we love. I always remind my students, that everyone, I remember we can be critical. And, you know, when we're talking about Get Out, I can't help but think of the skeleton key, a very similar narrative of invading Black bodies and moving spirits from, you know, person to person and erasing history. And I think that it's a really important thing to be thinking about who are these filmmakers and what are the perspectives we're being shown? Because if we keep being taught those same things, if we don't allow other voices, then we're never going to change that history. We're just bound to repeat it again. I took this class called African American Cinema when I was in undergrad, and it was one of the film classes that like changed the way I watch movies forever, because we read a book in this class that was called Black Film as a Signifying Practice, and I learned what signifying meant, and it was basically wow. talking about the fact that movies are such a reactive art, because so much of what happens is you watch a movie, and either you don't see your experience reflected on screen at all, or you see your experience reflected in a way that is not authentic, not accurate. And that was so like eye-opening to me. It changed the way that I watched like any film that is not by some sort of majority community. And it shows me like why it's so important to have such good representation and visibility on screen for all different stories. And it's why I'm just like, I want everything. I want to see it all. Like I want to learn more about the world through how they see themselves and, and how they choose to make movies about their experiences. But I'm just like, so excited about this conversation and particularly this like the oppositional gaze like talking about how there are other views to look at cinema even black cinema other lenses within the black community to explore queer we're talking about women we're talking about um interracial like there's oh my gosh so many things black exploitation it was in 60s it produced a certain type of movies but the movies that we have now it's like tokenism you know and it's like hijacking the hijacking the agenda. Yesterday, I I opened Hulu, and the first movie that comes on top is The Help. And I was so mad 
I was so mad. I I hate the help. I think it shouldn't have been made. I think it promotes all the wrong things. And it's like complete subversion of what films about black women should be about. Woman King, yes. The help, no, no, no. Why is it there? I mean, is anybody else was, was outraged by this film? Because for me, this film and like so many others, they all embody their own things. They perpetuate stereotypes. I have to comment because we have to talk about the fact that Viola Davis got nominated for The Help and didn't get nominated for Woman King. Just saying, just saying. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Since you asked, I hated The Help so much, I coped with it by watching Hidden Figures. Just putting it out there. We could, figures, but, we could do a whole thing on hidden figures. We could do a whole video just on on hidden figures. Oh my gosh, right, exactly. everybody yeah. in that. I was always wondering why movies on black issues are always focused on what is wrong. Why there are so little movies about what is right, like something that can give pride to black children. Because this is very important in, in children's psyche. You know, like I have children, I see them going to school. I see how their vision of the world is formed. If you constantly are bombarded by like messages, like this is these are the problems of this community, then you start seeing this community as only having problems. You don't know that this community has like a rich history. For example, why there is no movie about Michaud? Oscar Michaud, he was the first pioneer Black film director. There was only one documentary that was broadcasted on PBS about Michaud. And the producer of this documentary, he said, I was so surprised that with all his illustrious, like he's an illustrated filmmaker, and uh, like why there are no movies about him? No one talks about him, but we get the help, you know? I like Black Clocks Men. I like it. It's a good movie. It's well made, etc. But why doesn't he look into figures in the Black community that can, like the Black kids, the next generation can be proud of and any American can be proud of because what is needed at this moment, these unifying figures, figures that have universal value that everyone can admire. In the Black History Month, we should learn about those figures. Really, I just think it comes down to the fact that you think about who who's the producers and who's the owners of all these different facilities, they're, they're white people, and especially considering that a lot of African-American people are in cinema or filmmaking in general. The majority of people are going to make films about the population they think have the most money and that will get them their movie made. They're gonna say, hey, okay, just you know, this is a white movie, but I'm gonna I'm gonna have this movie about like somebody like uh, that Michael Bay will probably like it, make this movie, make it really cool, make it epic, and so like they'll make a story and they'll pitch it to the studio and it'll get picked up by them. Another thing was the victimship that I think a lot of people like don't really see and don't really understand that that's the way that African American people think about themselves just because. You know, I grew up in South Carolina, so like all of my school, like we had South Carolina history and, you know, slave trade was very big down there and it's a southern city, southern state. A lot of people are just like not inherently racist, but their families come from a time where we're like it was heavily dominant in the area. I grew up in the country, so like I didn't see as much of this because I actually... I was able to kind of have my mindset in a different place where I was more about like trying to improve myself and not have a victim mentality. That a lot of people did, but going in a lot of high schools in North Charleston, there was a lot of victim mentality because their parents are poor. They blamed the world for all the troubles that they had. They looked and say, hey, because of slavery, this is why we end up being like this and, and, and kind of like not going and and trying to take advantage of the opportunities that, that are given because there are a, a good number of opportunities. Of course, there always could be more, but that's kind of what allow African-American boys and girls to to not want to aspire to grow up and, and get some of these movies made about like the peanut guy for example like nobody made a movie about him i feel like i have to push back and i really hope we're still friends everyone after this but to me this is just a conversation about black excellence and people missing the conversation about a lot of black people feeling like i'm tired of having to be excellent like i want movies that 
show my struggle. I also want movies that are joy. They don't, it, it's not a dichotomy. It doesn't have to be no slave movies, no racism movies. It, it's, we need both. We need some joy movies. We need some romance movies. And we also need movies that talk about the struggle. Also, I just feel like we have to be careful when we say movies that people can be proud of because I am proud of the history, even the struggle because we made it through and we're still progressing and we're still here. Actually, I was going to bring up the fact that a lot of things, a lot of the problem to me about Black horror is that things that are not considered horror films are horror films to me. 12 Years a Slave is a horror film to me. Like one of the worst things in the world to me is I can't watch slavery movies right before bed because that is what my nightmares will be filled with. And I think that a lot of people want to, in a, in a positive way, in their mind at least, they want to say, we need to move on and show certain things. But those, the ramifications of slavery are still here today. It's not a matter of pick yourself up. It's a matter of, yes, there are opportunities, but we also need to be cognizant. And this is for any group. This is women. This is gay people. Because I think gay people, you know, LGBT people, we get the same thing. Oh, what do we need coming out movies for? Everybody's out now. Everything's great. There are still people killing themselves for being gay. It's not just because in the West we have more movies about coming out doesn't mean that like it's not a struggle and that those films need to stop being made. So I just think we just have to be careful because this is getting into language where I feel like we're saying, you know, personal responsibility, get up, pick it up. And I feel like we have to think about broader issues that are affecting people and not turn this into an argument about like, you as an individual are responsible for everything that happened to you when the system is still here. It's still functioning. It hasn't changed in 400 years. So I just want to be careful with that and just point that out. You see films like Black films, and even though they're kind of problematic, you're still proud about it. I'm thinking about Catwoman. This was the one with Halle Berry. I grew up watching women on screen. I grew up watching them kick ass. I grew up watching Charmed. I sort of grew up watching Buffy. And yes, there's a pattern of white women on the screen, but the matter of fact is I grew up watching women in power. So I think Halle Berry was the first Black superhero that I see, Black woman superhero that I've seen. And even though we can argue that the film's a little bit problematic, I, I just really liked how she made Black women sexy. Let's forget about the male gaze for a second. It's a good sexy. It's about feeling it's proud of being Black. It's an empowered yes. sexy. It's not meant yes. to be about the male gaze. Yes, that's exactly it. Uh, Halle Berry, I think, is, is usually sexualized in Hollywood. But when I see her in Cat, as Catwoman and Storm, I really got a sense of that empowerment. So... I really like that, even though that in that film it was a little bit problematic, it, there is this sort of Black joy. There have been a lot of films directed by mostly b Black men, and what they did was there were still stereotypes. So for the Black community, it's a question of, if you're Black, why are you portraying these uh, Black characters like this? Shouldn't you be portraying, portraying us as good? So why are you having like these Black characters who are like bad? I really like films that do a discourse on stereotypes. So instead of asking, why do Black people do voodoo, just act like, like, how did this came to be? One of the stereotypes that always stay with me are, why are Black women ghetto? Because I heard this so many times in middle school, ratchet, ghetto, they kind of all mean the same thing. And I just want to find out, okay, why? don't ask, why are Black women ghetto? First of all, where did this ghetto come from? There's this movie called Girlhood, directed by Celine Fikama. That film did a discourse on why, uh, why you would think Black women are ghetto. It's a, really a performance, you know, we're not... Black women aren't ghetto in nature. It's just that's their way of showing their strength. One could argue this could be connected to Moonlight. Why does Chiron have this toxic masculinity? Because of performance. That's his way of like surviving through society. So that's when I think of with Black women. It's like we have our own way of fighting back. A lot of people would think that it's kind of dirty. It's, it, it's not civilized. I kind of like this idea of in girlhood that you're connected. You have this own circle. And it's nice. It's kind of like a sisterhood. So that's kind of what I always wanted to be a part of that, that way it doesn't really seem ghetto. There's something very natural about it. This kind of behavior does become contagious. I know because, you know, in middle school, I kind of, I had my own little thing, ghetto, I don't know what you want to call it that way, but, but yes, I did perform in that. I performed because that was my way of surviving through tough times. And that's kind of, I understood what was happening in the film. So this whole angry black woman, ghetto woman, it all has to do with so much pressure on us, the stereotypes on Black people and just sort of giving into it, kind of like fade back to Moonlight, this whole thing about we're destined to be this sort of stereotype, so we're just going to be coming instead of fighting it. All kinds of films are necessary. I just want to draw your attention to what films are like propelled into the focus, you know, mm -hmm. of public attention. 
And I think we should also like strive to broad the frame. I really love Catwoman and I don't understand why it was like so put down. I really don't understand. And maybe that's the reason that like a black woman was portrayed, like was portraying a sexy, powerful character. And I think it might have been also a payback to Hailberry for Bullsworth. <laughs> Did you see Bullsworth? Bullsworth when she said to Warren Beatty, like who who is like a president, like on the run, right? When she she says maybe black leaders are all black leaders have been killed. Maybe that's why. And then she launches in this like like uh, economic analysis what happened to like black community jobs like blue color jobs etc and he's kind of there like like what like he didn't expect because exactly he thinks like oh she wears dreadlocks she she has nothing in her head but she's pretty right and then she gives him that and for me it was in 98 i still remember that i still this phrase when she says like maybe because like all black leaders were killed like you know it's stuck with me it actually defines my like a certain view on on what's happening spike lee's do the right do the right thing movie Bullworth and like uh, do the right thing are decades apart but they are honest films you know they they speak like you know like they say what they say they talk about the problems they talk about stereotypes, they talk about the struggles, but they are honest about it. There is no this like gloss that is basically, you know, like it's just like basically subverting like our thinking and like diverting our attention in the wrong way. Exactly like what what Amy uh, Amy mentioned about the other. The other, it's it's a concept that came from Nietzsche. Nietzsche was the ideologist of like the, the Nazi movement. Those like racial stereotypes that are like packaged differently, that's what I'm against of. But I also want to widen the frame. That's awesome. That, I kind of think we actually agree actually in that aspect. Since you mentioned uh, Catwoman, right? The, the, the male gaze, that was my own experience with Catwoman. I did like the movie, but something about the gays did feel icky to me so when i watched birds of prey and journey smollett as a black canary that is precisely what i want uh, i mean the vibe or storm for that matter actually storm or starfire in titans right like these are the gazes that i really want more of you can really feel like they are feeling comfortable in their body they feel they're empowering us by being that way by looking that way and it's less about us fetishizing what they look like and more about them empowering us. One thing that flew under people's radar is Issa Rae's rap shit. That is one where I actually saw an actual conversation about what you were mentioning, Samoy, because the protagonist, she starts rapping on really political stuff like, you know, to the work that Tupac was doing and uh, her teammate or bandmate or whatever you want to call her, Mia, she's much more into the music where like, yeah, I just want to have fun, you know, like hype us up and let's not always talk about how racism is affecting us and everything. And I'm not always a big fan of Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion, but hearing that conversation, I really understand the reason why, as you said, it's like putting on an act. Maybe I, I'm, not, I'm not the perfect right person to talk about it, but I just feel like it's a good recommendation because that's the first time I saw it talked about on screen, how that disparity can affect two people from the same community who grew up together, but still have different views about it. The thing about Breaking Up Catwoman that's interesting to me is that I actually think that's part of why I want more Black women spectatorship and Black women in filmmaking, because I think Halle Berry's are overrepresented. The reason I like Starfire from DC Titans is because it's an unambiguous Black woman. She doesn't have to be mixed or lighter skin or have like, you know, straight hair for her to be represented. And there's an overabundance of that. Even when Black filmmakers are making films, sometimes especially Black men, there's an overabundance of mixed women and biracial, multiracial women playing Black monoracial women. And so I just think we have to be careful when we talk about lenses, if that makes sense, just because even if it's a Black lens, there are a lot of Black lenses. And some of them don't include all of us. Sometimes I'm erased as a Black gay man. You know, sometimes dark-skinned Black women are erased because, you know, there's an overemphasis on biracial and lighter-skinned types of people, even in the Black community, because of colorism. And so 
That's why I think films talking about struggle are real because I still run into people in 2023 who are like, what's colorism? Even though it's literally running circles inside the black community, the same way racism is running circles on the outside of the community, you shouldn't be able to track socioeconomic status by someone's skin tone, but you can. So, you know what I mean? That's why it's important to have movies that talk about the struggles people are actually having. Everybody's story is different. Everybody has a different socioeconomic background, a different gender identity, sexuality. There are so many different lenses. And so even if you're seeing the same story, but you're seeing it from a different, slightly different perspective, it gives a whole, it's a whole new world. And I think in addition to just having a bunch of different lenses in cinema, this is also why it's so amazing to me that there's so many different streaming platforms, there's so many different forms of media that you can consume because sometimes you can't find yourself and your story on one platform in one specific place. But if you look just slightly outside of that, there's other forms of art that we can find ourselves in and that's so amazing to me. Sometimes things start out as theater, but then they move into movies or into TV or something starts out as TV and it moves into theater. So as you start to become aware of just how vast the arts community is and how many different storytellers are getting to tell their stories in certain spaces or want to tell their stories or have a story to tell. It's just, this is why I feel like it's better to consume as many things as possible because sometimes you can't find yourself somewhere specific, but it doesn't mean that you're not out there. I know this is mainly about movies and maybe a little bit about TV, but I think that there are other places that you can find yourself too and being open to that and being aware of the fact that the person who's telling your story the way that you need to see it to feel valid in who you are, maybe just outside of where your lens is. And sometimes it's not even your lens. Sometimes it's somebody else's lens that you didn't realize that you actually really relate to that can give you that validation. And that's so amazing to me as well, because I've felt so seen by so many of these movies and I'm not black. But that doesn't mean I can't relate to the things that these characters are going through. That's something I had to like unlearn. Like I think a lot of us when we're growing up, we think we have to literally see ourselves on screen in order to relate to the character. But the more that I've consumed art and movies and TV and everything, I'm finding bits and pieces of myself in a lot of places that I wouldn't have necessarily known. And oh my gosh, it's such a relief. It's such a relief to be able to see bits of my story show up in other places because it really does make you feel like, oh, I'm real. This is a real struggle that somebody's going through. Even somebody who doesn't exactly look like me, it's still a very, you know, relatable thing. So, And that's a sign of a really great movie when Agreed. you take it from these like particularities of this group and make it universal. Because human experiences, they are universal. And the greatest filmmakers, that's what they do. They make particular stories universal. Like, even if you're speaking directly to something that you went through, it doesn't mean someone else isn't going to connect to it. There is universality in specificity. And I have a question uh, regarding colorism. Like, Hale Berry might be considered the light skin, but she's a working actress. She she made her way to the Oscars. You know, she worked hard and she comes from underprivileged background. Lupita Nyong'o, she is very dark skinned, but she graduated from Yale. She has favors of all the best designers in the world. She's privileged. The crazy thing about Lupita is that she actually talks all the time. If you read her biography or like interviews, she talks about all the time being made to feel like she was ugly and that she was worthless and all this other stuff, despite being a privileged person whose father had lots of money. You know, growing up in Mexico, she was always called names until she would never make it in acting. And then the other problem is, so she had that disadvantage, yet because of her economic privilege, she had the ability to keep trying despite not getting things initially because she's from a wealthier background. So that's how those two things can kind of like play with each other, right? She still to this day, despite being on Beautiful People's List, will talk about colorism and, and how she felt and cry which I think is weird because like we're all like, you're beautiful. And she can literally get on an interview and cry because she remembers being made to feel like she's not beautiful or she's not pretty. I will also say that Halle Berry being biracial is another experience. And I actually think that biracial people's experiences get erased because they get lumped into just being black. And I think that that's something a lot of my biracial friends talk about that they don't feel like they get to talk about any other experience that they have as a biracial person It's just, when it's time for a Black person because of colorism and anti-Blackness, you're the best pick because you're light-skinned and mixed with a certain grade of hair. 
And so we just have to be careful. When I say like, I want different gazes, I don't want Halle Berry to not have work. I just want the Lupitas of the world to be out there. I think Lupita is important because lots of little girls, you can go on YouTube and find compilations of little girls looking at people like Lupita and saying, she's beautiful. She looks like me. I can do this too. I was told that I can't be an actress. I'm too dark. I, I you know, I look a certain way. And so I just think that's why she's very important. And even when you talk about a film like Moonlight, I can't even necessarily relate to being a drug dealer guy from Florida in the 80s. I cried when I watched that film in theaters because I felt like my story was on the screen, even though he wasn't exactly me in all his demographic detail, if that makes sense. And so I just think that's why representation is important. I think it goes beyond physical representation. It can be mental or like roles like MG was saying, but I think that's why representation of all types, whether that's like the type of person, the personality or the physicalness, I think that's why it's important. So like who better reflect the stories? Like who deserves to be on screen? Hale Berry, Lupita Nyong'o, like in this like colorism scheme of things, like where do they stand? Help me to locate them. Lashana Lynch, that's who. <laughs> Father well, Davis. They both deserve to be on screen, but Halle Berry has, Halle Berry and Zendaya have been on screen in overabundance for a long time. So if we were talking about corrective action, they would take a backseat and for the Lupitas of the world to actually get a chance to be on screen a little bit more. And we would also remove the barriers that let Zendaya's get on there more. So when we talk about privilege, we're not talking about you had it easy. We're talking about you didn't have certain obstacles in the way. If I know right. you're not coming for Zendaya right now. That's all I'm saying. I know you're not coming for Zendaya. I like Zendaya. <laughs> okay. Yeah, like it's more like- I get it, I get it, I totally get it. But yeah. So but who would be more authentic? Who is able to depict like stories of black women of today in America? Who would be more authentic? I feel like so much of it is the like just systemic racism of Hollywood and the film industry that makes these opportunities not available to people who are darker skinned. It's not because they're not talented. It's literally like this is the system is rigged against certain people and it's been rigged against them for decades and it's not right and it's not fair and it doesn't actually make sense if you really think about it but because of the way that like just the world is run there's just certain people that have not been given a chance to to show how how talented and amazing they are i mean we're hoping to do something about that and you know i don't know if we specifically are going to do anything about it but i think just speaking to it and acknowledging it is a good first step so that other people are aware of the fact that that's the case so I want to talk about what we all want to see in Black film specifically in the future. What do you want to see in Black film going forward? And actually, we'll start with Donna since you kind of brought it up. I would start from outside the U.S. Because, for example, when I was working in Central America, I discovered that there, there are very interesting Black communities, like Garifuna, Creole communities, that live across Central America on the coastal areas and also like even in Mexico. So I would like to include the movies about them, extend the geographic scope of where Black people live because their lives are very, very different, but extremely interesting. It's like fascinating, you know, I was like, wow, like when I was there, I would like to know more about it. And I also would like my children to know more about it. I would also like to see honest films, not black exploitation. But what you just said, Andrew, opened my eyes about like uh, contribution of privileged black women like Lupita and Beyonce. You know, they I would like them to support more production of shows and films about their experiences and experiences of of, of the community. Great points, awesome, awesome, Warren. I want to go with you next. Of course, uh, everything what she just said but I'll, I'll make it very more specific because she was talking about other regions. I would like to see, there's a movie that's like Compass, something with a timeline movie where it's different timelines and different places, but the story goes, it's like a continuous story. I would like to see stories from different regions where we take 1600s Africans in this part of the world and, and have it be like, this is what one generation was like, this is what one gen next generation was like, and this is what, you know, whatever the current generation is like. And maybe have a series that goes kind of like around the world to different places because it's different everywhere you go. Think about South Africa and apartheid. Like if that's, they had a different struggle than what we did here in America. I would like to see that. You want to make that movie. Don't lie. Warren. I would you probably, want to make yeah, that of movie. course. If I could be a part of it, yeah, of course. I would watch it. <laughs> yeah. I would definitely watch it. 
Um, let's go to AJ. Okay, so again, my background is mostly in horror, so I might be a little horror specific. This. I think we've already touched on a lot of the things that I would like to see change, but more intersectional representation. And I'm talking about behind the camera and in front of the camera. I want to see more with color making film, writing film. We have the film like Tangerine where we have our central protagonist, a Black trans woman. I think that's so exciting. And this idea that we can, you know, start to represent more identities on screen. And I think the best way that we can do that at intersectional identities behind the camera and writing those stories and crafting those narratives. So I like fun movies too. Tangerine was a fun film. Catwoman was a fun film. And if we're going to do horror, I think I feel like all the films, particularly, I go from the more feminist perspective, but I say that sometimes when they get very feminist, we start to lose some of the joy of the genre. I use the example of the most recent Black Christmas. I don't feel like there's a lot of fun in that film so I think we can have these films that are you know straighted with a really important political commentary but also can love the genre and have a great time and I think Jordan Peele is a great example of someone who is taking you know the fun of different genres we're getting you know sci-fi in there we're getting neo-western we're getting horror we're getting all of it merging together we're cross boundaries and I think we need to keep doing that keep pushing and I think we're just we're just starting so awesome awesome Bonnie what do you want to see I actually kind of agree with AJ I consider myself as a feminist and as well as like someone who supports anti-racism when it comes to black stories like I think that blacks like they're like like underrepresented in a lot of movies, especially when it comes to like aimed toward ch kids and families, because most of the time they involve like white actors, or if in the case of the animation, all of the anime characters are white. Disney Studios, like they responded uh. to the Black Lives Matter protest by incorporating black stories. There's this L The Little Mermaid, like how Bailey starts in that movie, and everyone's talking about it. I mean, yes. And there's a lot of protests saying like there's a black mermaid, but like it's just like supporting the black girls and like it's like. Um, Samoy, let's go to you. Maybe more characters are like Meg from um, A Wrinkle in Time. So I'm talking about the one directed by Ava DuVernay and Storm Reid played Meg. So that was an interesting choice because I, I never really thought of Meg as white except from watching the first live action film. When I, when I was reading the book, I can immediately connect to Meg. And I don't think there was any description of her being white. Maybe there was, I just don't remember, but I, I, I didn't really think of race at that time. I just really connected to how she was feeling, the insecurities. So pulling back to Storm Reid, you know, I, I would really like some black girl characters that are, that are like Meg that don't really, there's kind of like this awkwardness. There's an awkwardness, whether it's like the skin, the hair, just kind of exposing that. And then to have this character later on sort of accept that the flaws are what kind of make you human. That's actually, I think that was, was what was happening in Wrinkle Time. A lot of it had to do with insecurities and trying to own it. And I definitely want something like what Janelle Mathe was doing in Dirty Computer. There was this music video called Pink, and I loved how she was showing um, Black women bodies. It was, it was very sexual, but kind of like in a good way. For someone who's not queer, there is this attraction. And I think this is kind of natural for women to, to feel, I, I'm going into like a whole different thing here, but I think it's natural for women to feel attracted to other women that's not necessarily identifying as queer. It just has a lot to do with seeing the beauty in your own body because it's really a reflection. So what was happening in pink is that um, because I identify as black, I'm like kind of, I'm kind of mirroring this idea of like, oh, wow, she's basically saying that my body is beautiful. She's basically saying my vagina is beautiful. That's exactly what she was trying to say in pink. More hair representation, tight curls. It doesn't necessarily have to be Afrocentric because everyone kind of, we've seen Afrocentric by one different um, hair representations for sure. All right. And Troy? I want more Lashana Lynch. I just like anything Lashana Lynch. But speaking of Lashana Lynch, like, more movies like The Woman King. I know the biggest selling factor to entire the world is like how they are the real Dora Milaje, how this was a historical thing that got erased. And of course, like it's so terrible that it got erased altogether. But like outside of the history part where like you see these black women, almost superheroes, honestly, she's a superhero to me, everyone there, like Viola Davis and all of them. And yeah, like more black women superheroes who are being filmed through the lens of black women who have like the black women, female gaze that we were talking about. And that is one of the biggest things that I want. And also so what AJ said, like fun horror, 
Wender and Wilde is uh, an example that I'm going to keep taking because finally the duo reunited, the, the OG comedy duo to me, the one I grew up watching. Uh, so Key and Peele made that together and the two as devils with the and the little girl as the protagonist, I don't know, the gaze right there. Again, a super fun movie and sometimes maybe we can just have that too instead of serious conversations all the time. Another thing that I really would love is more of characters like Janelle Monet from Glass Onion. The, the kind of story where, you know, like exploitation is happening, but instead of that being the center central point, it's more than revenge. I, I don't have the words exactly right now, but if you've seen it, you know probably what I'm talking about. And, and horror movies, I don't know if you've seen the new Slumber Party Massacre, a new one. The protagonist is a black girl who is taking revenge for the massacre that happened to her mom's group of friends before. And I just love everything about that movie much. I mean, everything, the trilogy is good, but that movie, I want, I, I want that to become a franchise. And speaking of franchises, of a franchise of Charlie's Angels, where Ella Balinska is honestly my, my biggest crush in that movie, and maybe more characters like her, you know? Yeah, that's what, like, yeah, maybe I'm not talking much about serious stuff. I just want superheroes and spies and, and stories that aren't really focused so much on Black women in roles. And also stuff like Tangerine, because come on, queer representation is, is still very, very rare, honestly. So yes to everything queer representation. Yeah. Last but certainly not least, MG. Just like more as like a simple answer, I just want more and I want more variety and I want what AJ was saying. Like I want intersectional representation behind the screen. I've, I've realized how important it is to have writers who've had different experiences, authentic experiences, getting to tell their stories. I, I want more opportunities for people who we don't know, who we've never heard of to get the chance to tell their story. I want more people getting to live their dream and show other people that it's possible. And I feel like that is why we need so many more different stories, so many more lenses being explored, particularly within the Black experience, because there is so much, so much rich history and struggle and joy to be experienced. So what all of you said, I'm going to big up a thousand. <laughs> <laughs> like a million. I'm going to raise you on the global thing and say, I agree. I want to see more stories from all over the diaspora, you know, Black Asian people, Black, you know, Hispanic people um, all over the globe. I also want to see movies that are before colonialism because Africa actually existed before colonialism and they had kingdoms and fun things going on. And so I would like to see movies about that. I'd also like to take us all the way into the future. And I'd like to see more Black Panther-esque things that, um, again, are fun, awesome, because I think the best way to address a lot of racism in film is to make movies about people. And yes, they can have commentary, but don't make it their entire, like, being in struggle. They can talk about this issue while living. And because I think that's how all of us are, like, right? I talk about colorism, I'm gonna talk about racism. It's not my life, though. Like, I still go out there and try to succeed. So I think, to tie into what Warren was saying earlier, that's how I would like to see things in the future. I'd also like to see, and this is going to sound contradictory, i like to see more colorblind casting, and i like to see more films that are monoracial. And I say that because I actually don't think there's anything wrong with an all-white film, or all Chinese film, or all, you know, Mexican film, or all Indian film. I just think there should also be colorblind film, you know, right, like Cinderella from 1997, where the best person for the job just gets the role, just like with, um, Halle Bailey being in The Little Mermaid. The director keeps coming out and saying, I didn't have an agenda. She auditioned, she had the voice of an angel, she fit the role perfectly. So we went with it. And so, and it's always funny because when people say, why does it matter what a person looks like? I'm like, right, why does it matter? So why are you upset? It's being changed if it shouldn't matter how the person looks in the first place, right? So your argument is kind of disingenuous. So those are the things I want to see, just more people of all types who, like you said, MG, don't get on film living their lives. I like to see more interracial love, but also more like, you know, just black on black love, right? I like to see everybody get represented. And so that's kind of like where I'll go with it. I want to see everyone get a chance to be represented in all kind of mainstream ways and hopefully see more lenses. Because again, no matter what group you talk about, Indian, 
you know, Mexican, Chinese, Japanese, there are lenses within those lenses too. There are multiple lenses within those lenses. And so I want us to keep getting down to the granular level of, even if we get down to this individual person on this day gets a lens, I want that for the future. Everyone gets a lens. So, and I think this was awesome. I hope everybody enjoyed like the round table. Um, I want everybody to give themselves like a huge round of applause because I feel like we did awesome. <laughs> this is our silent digital applause. <laughs> Yeah, and that's a wrap, right? Should we pose? Do something funny?